Hello everyone and welcome to this exclusive interview for my channel, The Peacock Trap, dedicated to educating about narcissism and the top source in Arabic about the topic. I'm Sahar Nedi and today we will learn about narcissism from one of its sources. Dr. Sam Vaknin is our guest today. He has written one of the first books on narcissism when it was first being explored in depth. This is where the terms come from that we use today to describe narcissistic behavior. We'll get to that shortly, but first let me introduce my guest. Dr. Sam Vaknin is visiting professor of psychology at Southern Federal University, Rostov in Russia, professor of finance and psychology at the Center for International Advanced and Professional Studies. He has an incredible amount of work on malignant narcissism and psychopathy since 95, including books, podcasts, blogs, articles, and videos. And so, of course, his work was one of my rich resources of information when I started researching for my book, The Peacock Trap, uh, in Arabic called Fakh Tawus, published last year, and then for this channel as an audio companion to the book. Sam, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today. You're extremely kind to have me. Thank you. Uh, my listeners and readers have many questions on dealing with narcissists and recovering from narcissistic abuse. So we will be all ears listening to your insights today. First of all, why are you an economist by education and practice so interested in narcissism and educating and counseling people about it? Is there some connection between success in business, for example, finance and narcissism? Well, actually, I'm, uh, my, my uh, academic degrees are in philosophy, in uh, physics, mm -hmm. and, and similar fields, but <laughs> not in economics. I used to be economic advisor to governments, and yes. I used to be a businessman, I used to be a banker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, a lot of um, narcissism, of course, in all these fields, yes. as evidence, for example, in Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And narcissism, that only goes to show that narcissism is actually a positive trait. Healthy oh, narcissism. Interesting, okay. Yeah, healthy yeah. narcissism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I would appreciate if, if we don't have these interjections all the time because it, it derails my train of thought. Oh, my apologies. Okay. It's my personal, my personal idiosyncrasy. No my problem. Apologies. No problem. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I need to... No, no, no. no not your fault at all. It's my, my thing. <laughs> um, so, healthy narcissism, known as also as primary narcissism, is a, a very good thing a very it leads to productive lives it underlies a sense of self-worth mm -hmm. um, it underlies self-confidence and self-esteem it drives people to to have ambition and to compete with other people mm -hmm. uh, to obtain relative positioning and so on and so forth so healthy narcissism is as the name implies healthy mm -hmm. it is it is when narcissism goes awry or to use the phrase coined by Kernberg, when it becomes malignant, mm -hmm. that we have a problem, when it is pathologized, when it becomes cancerous. Mm -hmm. But today there is a growing body of uh, evidence in academe as well, mm -hmm. um, that um, there is a subclass of narcissists, they're known as high-functioning narcissists or mm -hmm. productive narcissists, mm -hmm. and even productive and high-functioning psychopaths which are actually beneficial to society mm -hmm. and, and very successful in certain professions and needed in order to further social, uh, social goals and um, to enhance the cohesion of society. So it's, uh, it, we can't throw the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. We need to make this distinction between the malignant forms and the healthy forms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So your fascinating book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, is one of the first books to talk about narcissistic personality disorder when it was just starting to gain recognition. Uh, narcissism was only recognized as men a mental health category in 1980 in the DSM-3. Is that correct? Yes. Narcissism was first included in the Di Di Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Edition 3, mm -hmm. and then expanded, expanded massively in the text revision which was 14 years later. Okay, so what do we need to revisit about narcissism in addition to, to the few points you just told us about how uh, functioning narcissism and uh, narcissists and, and psychopaths are uh, useful to society? Well, the truth is that, that um, the study of narcissism stagnated in the 1970s with Kohut. And ever since then, since the publication of the book by Christopher Lash, The mm -hmm. Cultural Narcissism, mm -hmm. The Culture of Narcissism, and the publication of Alex, uh, Alexander Lowen's book, um, it, it died, the whole field died. 
From the 1970s onwards, there, was n there hasn't been a single serious study of narcissism. There hasn't been a single book published about narcissism. My book was not among the first, it was the first. Mm -hmm. The web website that I set up was the first, and for mm -hmm. 10 years, the only website. Mm -hmm. The support groups I've established for victims of narcissistic abuse have been the only support groups for well over six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm mentioning this is to show you the lack of awareness the lack of realization, even among victims, that they have been exposed to a unique form of abuse. Mm -hmm. Not run-of-the-mill abuse, but a unique form of abuse. And let me, with your permission, delineate the differences between the two. Please, yes. In 1995, I coined the phrase, narcissistic abuse. And of course, this raised immediately the question among scholars at the time and others, mm -hmm. why do we need a subspecies of abuse? Why not just say abuse? Mm -hmm is because narcissistic abuse is different. In typical abuse, the abuser targets a dimension of the victim. Uh -huh. The abuser can target the victim's body in physical and sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. The abuser can target the victim's insecurities, um, finances, legal status, whatever. Mm -hmm. A typical abuser isolates a vulnerable dimension of the victim and attacks it relentlessly and repeatedly until the victim succumbs. Okay. In narcissistic abuse, the picture is very different. The narcissist does not attack a single dimension. Actually, the narcissist does not single out any dimension or any aspect of the victim. The narcissist attacks, attacks the very existence of the victim, okay. the victim's being, the victim's separateness, the victim's individuality and personal autonomy, mm -hmm. the victim's ability to operate in all settings, not only in a single setting. The victim's, uh, the victim's separateness, uh, the victim's social milieu, the victim's uh, financial independence, everything is attacked simultaneously in mm -hmm. order to obliterate the victim as a separate object, wow. <laughs> as a distinct object, mm -hmm. in order to subsume the victim, mm -hmm. to digest the victim, mm -hmm. to merge and fuse with the victim. Now, of course, this is understandable because narcissism, pathological narcissism, is the outcome, is the reactive pattern to a consistent, repeated, premeditated breach of the child's emerging boundaries as an individual. Okay. When the child begins to separate from the parent and becomes an individual, a process known as separation, indiv individuation, mm -hmm. the immature parent the narcissistic parent reacts with panic. The parent tries to obliterate, to destroy, exactly. to eradicate mm -hmm. the child's emerging boundaries, mm -hmm. to prevent the child from acquiring any modicum of self-efficacy, agency, and personal autonomy. Okay. The, ch the parent tries to take over the child as an extension of the parent, as an instrument of gratification, as a tool to realize the parent's unfulfilled dreams, Mm -hmm. as anything. So the parent breaches the boundaries, again, physically, and that would be incest or sexual abuse, mm -hmm. or beating, repeated beatings, mm -hmm. psychologically, verbally, in any possible way. The narcissist, when he grows up, simply replicates the parental pattern. Okay. He treats his partner as a child and tries to prevent her from forming boundaries with him. And if she does have boundaries, he tries to remove them by force, by coercion, by bullying, wow. and generally with a variety of transformations of aggression. Narcissist panics when he is confronted with a disparate, distinct, intimate partner. Okay. Narcissist identifies intimacy with death. The narcissist is an ancient Egyptian. He wants to mummify everyone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's an interesting description I've never heard before. But actually, yeah. I thank you so much for the um, the very detailed and accurate and precise description of the the psychology of how a narcissist is made in childhood. Um, would you call that is this acquired narcissism, or should people have some biological uh, predisposition to be narcissists, or how does it work? One should be very careful with the term acquired narcissism because mm -hmm. it, it was first proposed by Milman okay. 
okay. professor, in, professor in Harvard, mm -hmm. and Milman coined the phrase acquired situational narcissism. Mm -hmm. It describes late onset narcissism. Narcissism that is that uh, begins to transpire in adulthood mm -hmm. and in response to certain life circumstances. So Milman studied rock stars. And he discovered that these rock stars have been totally normal, non-narcissistic individuals, but owing to their exposure to celebrity and uh, the onerous the onerous conditions of being being famous, mm -hmm. they reacted with narcissistic defenses so extremely that they had actually become narcissists. Wow. Mm -hmm. So this is late onset narcissism, you know, like late onset dementia. Yes. Dementia. Yes. So uh, as distinct from that the typical pathological narcissism begins to develop between the ages of four and six. These are known as formative years. Yes. And it is, in almost 100% of the cases, a reaction to an immature narcissistic parent who tries to force the child to not separate and to not individuate okay. and in a variety of ways by breaching boundaries, as I have described. So narcissism is acquired. However, however, there's a caveat. Ten children can be exposed in the same family to the same parents mm -hmm. with similar upbringing and similar you know methods mm -hmm. yet only typically only one of them would become narcissist a narcissist so it stands to reason that there is a genetic propensity and predisposition to narcissism although we hadn't proved it yet there's no specific gene or gene array which is associated with narcissism nor is there any knowledge about anything in the brain that corresponds directly with narcissism. In psychopathy, we know that the brains of psychopaths are not the same as the brains of normal people. Yes. We also know that the bodies of psychopaths react very differently to the bodies of normal people, for example, when they are exposed to fear. Mm -hmm. That is not the case with narcissists. We don't have a single physiological, cerebral, neural, or genetic um, correlate between uh, the body of the narcissist and his mind. Mm -hmm. Yet, the fact that not all children become narcissists when they are exposed to the same parents, and we are talking even about identical twins, yes. proves probably that there is some genetic component. We have yet to discover it. Okay. Okay, but as normal people, as, as everyday people, is there a way for, for us to be able to differentiate between a narcissist or malignant narcissist and a psychopath? Are there any differences? Yes, quite a few, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in dealing with them, uh, if, if we're not having brain scans or anything like that in, right, in right, everyday yeah. life. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's precisely the reason why the committee of the latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, yeah. the... The fifth edition, the fifth edition yeah. which was published in 2013. Mm -hmm. This committee, which had deliberated for almost 20 years, uh, the committee had decided to leave intact the two diagnoses, not to merge them, not to, although there were many voices, uh, some of them influential, and, and even my voice, I was among the first to suggest that these are actually two, two sides of the same coin. Okay. These views were rejected uh, decisively. And over the years, I grew to accept this rejection and to I, I, I reached a conclusion that I had been wrong. And these, these are really two distinct clinical entities. Yeah. Okay. Take, take into account, for example, the fact that narcissists are pro-social. In other words, they need other people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They require, they need something called narcissistic supply, mm -hmm. which, which is a fancy term for attention. The attention could be positive, could be negative but they need attention all the time. They use this attention to regulate their sense of self-worth, to, to establish a reality test. This attention is what tells them everything they need to know about themselves and their place in the world. Okay. In the absence of this attention, they are very disoriented and gradually begin to crumble and disintegrate. So this attention is very crucial. And it is in effect what we call an ego function. It's something that most people perform from the inside but the narcissist needs to import it from the outside. So the narcissist is dependent on other people. And because he's dependent on other people, he knows how to work with people. He knows how to flatter them. He knows how to manipulate them. Yes. He knows how to, you know, he, he needs them. 
The psychopath, on the other hand, in, in the vast majority of cases, is a lone wolf. Uh -huh. The psychopath is antisocial, not pro-social. Even when the psychopath engages in a charm offensive, even when the psychopath has very well-developed social skills, even then, it's very short-term. The psychopath would deploy the charm, would use his social skills, would strike like a snake, take what he wants, money, sex, power, mm -hmm. and then turn it off. The narcissist would never turn it off. The narcissist needs this to go on forever. So pro-social, anti-social. Second thing, narcissists depend and seek only narcissistic supply. The, the light motif, the main obsession and compulsion of the narcissist is to obtain narcissistic supply. If the narcissist is interested in money, it's because he wants to use money to show off and to brag. And by showing off and bragging, obtain attention. Okay, so that's the end If, that he needs, just to be able to show off with what he has. This is the objective of, of his His objective is to garner attention. Yes. Mm -hmm. The psychopath is actually goal-oriented. He wants money, so he gets money. He mm -hmm. wants sex, he gets sex. He wants power, he gets power. Mm -hmm. He's goal-oriented. He doesn't care what people think of him, about him. Oh, okay. he, he, he's utterly uninterested in narcissistic supply. He's interested in, in the instruments that the narcissist uses to obtain supply, but he's interested in, in these instruments as the ends, not as the means. Not as the means, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so... Um... One interesting um, uh, aspect of your book, um, uh, Malignant Self-Love, when I read, is, is that you actually include narcissists and psychopaths in the book as some of its audience. And, and that is very fascinating. What do you hope to achieve from addressing people who are described, as you just told us right now, who are manipulative, who want to use other people, who want to, uh, you know, grow their their image and their um, and their place in life uh, on the shoulders of others. How can they be your audience as well? Well, everyone likes to read about, especially narcissists, <laughs> like to read about themselves. <laughs> okay. It's like a mirror. They 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 love actually narcissists are emotionally invested. They have a process called cathexis. Uh -huh. They are emotionally invested. They are protected in their own disorder. It is untrue, it's a myth, that narcissists are not self-aware. The vast majority of narcissists are totally self-aware. Okay. Only, only, they regard what other people regard as a disorder or a dysfunction. The narcissist regards as an evolutionary advantage. The narcissist considers this disorder as the next stage in evolution. Oh, okay. there, is, there is narcissists and there are inferior humans. And when all humanity becomes narcissistic, this is the stage where you, this is the transition stage to the next level of evolution. Narcissists are proud of their disorder and their dysfunction. They believe that it renders them unique. It renders them creative. Very often narcissists would say, if I get rid of my narcissism, I will not be creative anymore. I will become humdrum. I will become, you know, like everyone else. Mm -hmm. I'll become an average Joe. It is my narcissism that drove me to these accomplishments and this recognition and celebrity and whatever. So narcissists cherish their narcissism as an asset. Uh, this is another distinction between narcissism, narcissists and psychopaths. Uh -huh. Psychopaths are proud of the instrumental aspects of their disorder. So a psychopath would tell you, uh, I don't tolerate nonsense. Or if someone insults me, I kill him. You know, they are, they are proud of their behavior Yes. Patterns and reactions. Mm -hmm. Narcissists are proud of the totality. Narcissists are proud of who they are. Psychopaths are proud of what they do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting distinction. Very interesting distinction. Mm -hmm. um, and I shared your description of narcissist pathological envy in my episode about pathological envy for my listeners in Arabic. And they Thank were you. shocked at how dark it is. You put it really, really eloquently. You, you really have a way with words, Sam. So can you, you tell us more about the deepest dark side of a malignant narcissist psychology? Um, the side that drives them to, to manipulate and use and maybe abuse other people. 
are they can they control those urges are they able to to distinguish be, between right and wrong are they able to stop themselves even if they have this very powerful drive to use others or abuse others do they have the tools to tell themselves no i'm not going to be doing that or or are they compulsive about it are they forced to do it well the answer is both mm -hmm. uh, strangely uh -huh. When you, when you look at prison populations, which is a work done for many decades by Robert Hare, yes. the uh, foremost authority on psychopathy, mm -hmm. when you look at prison populations, both narcissists and psychopaths know how to behave. They, they, follow, they follow codes and rules, even unwritten rules, among criminals. Yes. They don't breach boundaries, they don't challenge, they don't... So they know how to restrain themselves. Why? Because to not restrain yourself in prison could be life-threatening. So it seems that given the right incentives, for example, if you do this, you will be dead, which is quite an incentive, you must admit. Given the right incentives, psychopaths and narcissists know how to behave themselves. They know how to pay attention to the needs and boundaries of other people. They know how to respect other people, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But in day-to-day -day life, in daily life, they don't care. And they don't care because there are no real sanctions. There are no, there's no real punishment for any of the things I've described. Mm -hmm. Psychopaths and narcissists rarely get punished, extremely rarely. And they get away with a lot all the time. Exactly. And, and so, they learn by process of, if you wish, operant conditioning yes. <laughs> they, or reinforcement. They learn that being daring, not paying attention to other people's rights, wishes, needs, emotions, boundaries, priorities, pays. Crime pays. Social crime, let's call it. Pays. Indeed, psychopaths, psychopathy, mm -hmm. not long ago, until the 1940s, used to be we used to be described as a as a character disorder yes mm -hmm. or as a social disorder not as a clinical entity not as a psychological disorder exactly. and to this very day i personally do not think that psychopaths are mentally ill i think they are people who whose view of society and what they can do and how they can operate in society is highly non-conformist and highly detrimental of course to everyone around them but that doesn't amount to mental illness. Not so narcissists. Narcissists are mentally disturbed. And so there's another distinction between the two. Okay. But both narcissists and psychopaths, if you give them the right incentives, if you threaten them with punishment, if you impose costs on their behavior, modify their behavior. And they become a lot more pro-social, conformist, and observe other people's rights and boundaries. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. So that means they can control their behavior. Okay. They just don't care. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting and very important because, of course, a lot of people who are interested in this topic, uh, being victims of, of uh, narcissistic abuse, want to know whether they should have more empathy for the narcissist since he or she is uh, sick and unable to control their urges or whether he or she choose to do what they do and do it intentionally and fully aware of what they're doing so you just gave us a very clear answer right here thank you so um let me also let yes. me also be clear with your permission yes please narcissistic personality disorder and personality disorders in general mm -hmm. are not are not mental illness uh -huh. they are not forms of mental illness they are disturbances in the regulation of some ego functions in other words, disturbances in the, in the relationship between the individual and reality. Yes. And inability, owing to underdeveloped empathy, something which I dubbed called empathy. Inability, because of a, of a deficient form of empathy, inability to engage in intimacy, to have real interest in other people, mm -hmm. and so on. So these are, I would say, um, as Milan suggested, Narcissism, Theodor Miller, narcissism is actu actually, in my view as well, a personality style. Yes. It's a very grating and abrasive and unpleasant and repulsive and dangerous and what have you personality style, but it is a personality style. Yes. It is very unfortunate 
that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, owing, owing to commercial insurance-related reasons, <laughs> had polluted and contaminated um, the, the whole field of clinical psychology <laughs> with problems which do not amount to mental illness. Okay. Schizo schizophrenia is mental illness. Mm -hmm. Bipolar disorder is mental illness. Some forms of depression are mental illness. Yes. No question about this. Mm -hmm. Pedophilia to a large extent is mental illness. Paraphilia, sexual paraphilia. I can give you a whole list. There's, there's enough mental illness to go around. Okay. There was no need to include personality disorders, certain types of addictions, and so on and so forth. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the first edition, was published uh, almost 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. The first edition had 100 pages. Today, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is a thousand pages. Oh, yeah. No other field of medicine, no other field of medicine ha um, had such inflation of diagnosis and, and you know. Okay. If you look at cancer textbooks of the 1940s, they have more or less the same number of pages as cancer textbooks of today. Mm -hmm. There's no other field in which the number of diagnoses went up 50-fold. Wow. Wow. There's something That's wrong with this inflation of diagnoses, you know? So can, can, can narcissists be treated? That's the, the next question um, related to what we were just discussing right now, of whether it is a mental illness or a personality disorder or a character type. Um, do you think there, there comes a moment for a narcissist uh, that makes him or her think, okay, enough of that, I need to look in the mirror, see who I really am, uh, recognize that I'm hurting the people I love the most, and seek help. And if they do seek help in the end, can they really change? Would they heal from narcissism, or will they only be given tools to control it? I have to contest almost every part of your question. Please. First of all, you are using the terms treatment and heal, okay. which which relate to an illness. But narcissism is not an illness, consequently it cannot be treated. Okay. And there's no need to heal from it. Interesting, okay. That's the first thing. Second thing, you said I'm hurting the people I love. But the narcissist hurts people because he's incapable of love. So there's no such thing as the narcissist loved ones. Or okay. the, it's a contradiction, it's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction in terms. Exactly, yes. If you're a narcissist, you don't have loved ones. So that's the second uh, bone of contention yes. in, in the question itself. Mm -hmm. Na narcissism, narcissism, as I said, is not a mental illness. It's a mode, a complex mode, of relating to the world via the mediation of a psychological construct which we call the false self. It's simply a way of obtaining from other people uh, some information and some emotional support that is that usually comes from the inside in a healthy person mm -hmm. the narcissist lacks lacks some equipment to regulate his internal environment to regulate his emotions to regulate his moods to regulate his self-esteem his self-confidence and his sense of self-worth so what he does the narcissist because he doesn't have this equipment to his so-called intimate partners to people around him and he says, listen, guys, I'm an invalid, I'm crippled. Can you please help me? I don't have these and these functions. Can you help me with these functions? Okay. And to motivate them to help him, the narcissist presents to them a facade, which is very convincing, a facade of a grandiose facade, which is also charming and manipulative and so on. And so this coerces them some, in some way to help the narcissist in regulating his internal environment. Now, this, is not, this does not amount to mental illness, because we all, including healthy people, we all manipulate our human environment to obtain certain goals mm -hmm. and to regulate our internal uh, processes. Mm -hmm. The question is a question of degree. Healthy people do it 10, and the narcissist does it 60. Okay. So it's only a question of degree. What the best we can hope to achieve with the narcissist is to teach him to regulate uh, his psychology by himself to some extent, okay. thereby weaning him off his dependence on other people and off his addiction to narcissistic supply. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So there comes a point that he says, wow, I can do this by myself. I don't need other people. I don't need supply. You know? okay. We can try to do that. And we can try to teach the narcissist to modify certain behaviors which are counterproductive. In other words, which result in, in damage to himself. Yes. The narcissist will not ever be motivated to modify behaviors which hurt and mm -hmm. damage other people mm -hmm. because he doesn't care about other people mm -hmm. and he doesn't care about other people because they do not exist in his mind mm -hmm. and they do not exist because he doesn't have empathy. So the only way to convince a narcissist to modify his behaviors is to demonstrate to him conclusively that his behaviors are bad for him. Mm -hmm. They are counterproductive. They undermine his goals. They defer and postpone accomplishments that he could have had without these behaviors. And they alienate people around him, render them enemies, and then they, you know, conspire against him and hurt him and so on. Once the narcissist is convinced that certain behaviors are bad for him, mm -hmm. these behaviors change. That has been proven in therapy. Now, all treatment modalities, all therapies, all psychotherapies that exist today are absolutely useless and helpless when coping with narcissism. This has many reasons. One one of which is the fact that the narcissist competes with the therapist wow. he converts he converts the therapy into a power play mm -hmm. and he tries to we either win over the therapist or subjugate the therapist or co-opt the therapist mm -hmm. bribe corrupt the therapist so the dynamic is sick to start with is unhealthy and it's impossible to establish proper distance therapeutic alliance and so on so all therapies fail with the narcissist this is precisely the reason why seven years ago I started to develop another treatment modality, mm -hmm. uh, which I dubbed cold therapy. Uh, this is a treatment modality that is built on a totally radically different perception of narcissism. Mm -hmm. And starting from this, from this radical new way of looking at narcissism, I came up with a treatment modality that I at this stage applied to 40, 40 something people, 47 people. Mm -hmm. All of them diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder officially. Mm -hmm. And uh, six, five, four, and three years later, they score very close to zero on the relevant tests. Wow. So they have lost they have lost their narcissism. Perfect. Mm -hmm. now, the cold therapy is based on, on two conceptual foundations which uh, view narcissism in a pre in a startlingly startly startlingly new way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk about it. It's your show, so you uh, tell me if you want. We can. Uh, we have a little time finished, so I'd I'd like to uh, to move on to the next question, and then you sure. can come back and we discuss more in the next episode, if you like. Sure, uh, sure. The question relevant to what you just told me is: Can narcissists be manipulated? I saw that in one of your articles you were discussing this this topic. What kind of person can do that, if at all? Narcissists can easily be manipulated. Tell us how. Because narcissists believe that they, they are omniscient, and they know everything, yes. they are omnipotent, mm -hmm. they are capable of everything, and they are godlike. They consider themselves gods. I actually regard narcissism as a form of private religion, where the narcissist worships his, his own false self. Exactly. Yeah. So the narcissist is both god and worshiper. Mm -hmm. So because of that, the narcissist believes, believes himself to be invulnerable. He believes that no one can be better than him. No one can cheat him. No one can deceive him. No one can pull the wool over his eyes. Mm -hmm. No one can. So he is not on his guard. He is he's utterly wide open to attacks by con men and fraudsters and so on. And, the, and psychopaths prey on narcissists. Wow. Mm -hmm. In the ecosystem, in the ecosystem of mental disorders or psychological disorders or character, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. psychopaths prey on narcissists and narcissists prey on victims. This is the pecking order. Okay. Um, because narcissists are really have something called pseudo stupidity. Mm -hmm. They are really pretty stupid. They, they, because they, <laughs> because their reality test is so distorted, they don't perceive reality properly. Yes. They don't read social cues. They are grandiose, so everything is filtered through their grandiosity. Mm -hmm. They're hypervigilant, so they scan all the time for insults and humiliations. 
So they are so preoccupied with this maintenance, with this high, high cost, high energy maintenance of the of this regime, yes. that they are they their flanks are wide open, and psychopaths mm. attack them mm. and prey on them simply. Um, thank you, because this is very important to our female les- listeners. The reason why I asked you this question is because a lot of women who are in love relationships with narcissistic men who are abusing them have the illusion that they can somehow acquire superpowers uh, to be able to manipulate them, despite the fact that those women are themselves the victims. And as you had just described to us um, in, in the ecosystem, uh, the, they, the, the narcissists can be manipulated by someone like a psychopath, but definitely not by his own victim, probably. Um, and so we come to the next question uh, of how can women in particular protect themselves from falling for the bad boy charm and charisma of a malignant narcissist? Um, can they at all avoid falling in the peacock trap and how can they protect themselves from that kind of manipulation? Well, they can't. They can't. They have they have fallen for a narcissist for their own psychological reasons. And this unless they treat these psychological reasons and change their own psychology, mm-hmm. they are likely to fall in the same trap again and again and again because they fall in this trap as a choice. And by the way, usually with eyes wide open. They fall in this trap because the narcissist offers them a deal. The narcissist offers them excitement, okay. offers them thrill, offers them, offers them risk, offers them abuse. This is the comfort zone of the vast majority of these women. Okay. I, from my experience, 20-something years, I have the biggest database in the world of victims and of narcissists. Huh. And um, from my experience, women victims of narcissists are divided to three groups. Healthy women, mentally healthy women, Mm -hmm. who simply misread the signs or were misled by a particularly astute and and practiced narcissist, they discover the true face of the of the intimate partner as a narcissist, and then they walk away. This is the first group, and it's a minority group. Mm -hmm. The second group are covert narcissists, inverted narcissists, um, women themselves narcissists who find in the narcissist the perfect match uh-huh. is a covert narcissist is a narcissist who cannot obtain supply by herself she needs to team up with a narcissist in order to obtain supply mm-hmm. and then she becomes an inverted narcissist so this group of women are narcissists among the so-called empaths online mm-hmm. i find that the majority are actually covert narcissists who have been out narcissized <laughs> by a classic, classic overt narcissist. Oh my God! Okay. And then, the, and this is also a minority group, a vocal, a very vocal minority group. They dominate the online scene. Uh-huh. Um, and the third group, which is by far the majority group, these are women who are codependent, borderline, have problems, severe problems with attachment, extreme abandonment and separation anxiety. Mm-hmm. Styles, styles of interaction which, which involve clinging and uh, extreme dependency, um, uh, attempt to merge and fuse with the loved one, attempt to control the loved one via merger and fusion, etc., etc. So all kinds of dysfunctional... Would you, would you dysfunctional, call them codependent? Are, are those codependent people? or Some. Some are codependent, some borderline, some others. Okay. Mm-hmm. But in all in all these cases, these are dysfunctional attachment styles. So this this is the majority of women victims, and they team up with narcissists because narcissists cater to their psychological needs. Narcissists are the perfect answer to their psychological needs. It's not an accident that they end up with narcissists. It's because narcissists gratify them because they need narcissists. Narcissists are helpful to them, and so some of these women, for example. Uh, abuse is their comfort zone. They know how to cope with an abuser. They know the ropes, they know the, the rules, they know how to predict the abuser's behavior. Some of them force their intimate partners to become abusers in order to be in the comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Some of them are codependents, and so they, they want to subsume and merge and fuse with the, with the narcissist. 
And the narcissist gives them the illusion through love bombing that this is possible, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et yes, these are all very sick pathological dynamics. At, at the end of the day, these are sick relationships that should yes. not be replicated, that should not be tolerated. Um, the, the victim does have part of the responsibility uh, of, of the abuse or, or going into the relationship that is hurting her without seeking help. Um, Sam, you have an enormous amount of information. I can't believe that, that we have managed to discuss so much in just 40 minutes, but uh, this is getting a bit longer than, than usual, and I would like people to have the time to digest what you just told us. Sure. So you are definitely welcome to come back and continue this interesting conversation, if you like. With pleasure. It's up to you. Thank you so much, Sam. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You're welcome to Thank come you back, definitely. Uh, we have more exclusive surprises coming up, so... Uh, please stay with us, people. Subscribe. Stay with us. See you next time. And while you wait, please don't fall in the peacock trap. This is Sahar Nedi wishing you health and happiness. And see you next time.